We had a few uh, messages in chapter 10, just three. Uh, just three in, I believe, chapter 9 as well. We're moving along. Uh, chapter 11, I said we're going to slow down a little bit, and we did. We looked at the first two verses. Let's read them again. Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Now, obviously, John was not being told to measure the temple that had been in Jerusalem, that it was destroyed in 70 A.D., uh, obviously, John's exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and this is a vision. And the temple had been destroyed long before this. Uh, he's talking about a future temple. John wrote the book of Revelation according to Irenaeus, a disciple of Polycarp who sat under John's ministry uh, in the 90s A.D., 30-some uh, years after Jesus was crucified. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, longer than that, 60-some years after the, Jesus was crucified, but 20-some uh, odd years after uh, the temple was destroyed. So it's important to understand that he's talking about a future temple. And last week's study, I got into a lot of scriptures that show that there'll be a future temple and that Jesus prophesied that there'd be a future temple that would be rebuilt. And here, the measuring has to do with God's sovereignty over the temple uh, and construction of the temple. And Jesus said there'll be the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, which is the temple. He referenced Daniel. We went to the book of Daniel in chapter 9, where the seven-year uh, peace treaty that's made by the Antichrist with the many is broken in the middle of the seven years, and he stops the sacrifices, and he sets up himself. He causes uh, a desolation. And then Paul said that the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is who? That he is God. Scriptures are very clear on this, and Revelation confirms all of this. And he says, leave out, verse 2, the court. Leave out the court, which is outside the temple. And it's interesting, in the Greek, it's an interesting construction. I've checked this uh, out. Uh, it's cast out the court that's outside. Kind of an interesting, it's not translated that way. It's interesting, though. Uh, leave out the court is a nicer way to put it, uh, which is outside the temple. And do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations, and they will tread it underfoot. They will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. So even when this is written, it's been given to the nations. Amen? Israel ceased to be a country after 70 AD. And this shows me that this is, you know, I mean, think about it. And I went through kind of some of the history uh, last Sunday, but I would just want to mention this. Uh, Jesus called at the time of the Gentiles. He talked about how he'd be rejected. Uh, by his own people, which he was. And pe people forget that the whole early church that did accept him early on was all Jews, though, right? The first church council in Acts 15 is a Jew it's all Jewish church questioning whether or not Gentiles could become Christians. Well, that was Peter's struggle in Acts 10 and 11. It was such a transition. If you understood the culture and so forth, how it was ingrained that salvation is just of the Jews, it blew Peter away that the gospel was all for the Gentiles. But the question wasn't whether Gentiles could be saved. I'm sorry, that was chapter 10 and 11 with Peter. But the question was whether they had to keep the law of Moses and how they were to be accepted into the church. And I love to share that with Jewish folks. A lot of Jewish folks don't even realize, believe it or not, that Jesus was Jewish and that salvation is the Jews. Amen? And this Bible is a Jewish book. Every New Testament book was written by Jews, except perhaps Luke, and that's debatable. And it's interesting because a lot of people, you know, they get uh, Gentile-centric instead of, uh, and I'm not saying we should be Jewish-centric either. We should be Christ-centric, amen? But we need to understand the Jewish roots and that salvation of the Jews and that God is not done with the Jews, amen? That God has a plan for the Jews. Romans 11, he says, there's, you know, he calls it a mystery, and he talks about how he doesn't want us to be uninformed that God's not done with Israel, and that there'll be a remnant, and that all Israel, that whole remnant, will be saved in the end. And I mentioned last week, I went through Zechariah, where uh, uh, two-thirds of, you know, people will, you know, many of them will be killed, but there'll be many that are faithful, that remnant that will go through the fire and be purified, many of the Jews. So we're talking about the temple, and it's interesting that Jesus said when they, re after he was rejected, that they won't see him again until they say the Jews, his people, won't see him again until they say what? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that will happen at the end of the tribulation period. The woman who is described in Revelation chapter 12, which we'll be studying uh, in weeks down the line here, is clothed in you know, the sun and the moon and the stars. And that's obviously, when you go to Genesis, a picture of Israel, the 12 patriarchs and the, 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 you know, the, the 12 tribes of Israel that 12 tribes come from. 
And that woman goes in the wilderness. After she gives birth, she's a mother. She gives birth to a child. Jesus came through the Jews. Amen? And then she flees in the wilderness. And she's protected there by God for three and a half years. But you know, it's interesting. After Satan realizes he can't destroy all the Jews, then he goes after those who have the testimony of Jesus. Who's that? Those who keep the commandments of God. That's the Christians. And so what people don't recognize is they think the church is gone and God's done with the Jews. Either or, or some both, you know, at this moment. And actually, both are very heavily in play here, okay? And I'm asking you to pray. Please pray, because we've got a deadline, somewhat of a deadline, because there's a new movie coming out, uh, Left Behind, new Left Behind movie, but it's not like the fourth in the installments. It's a brand new movie called Left Behind, a, a, a more major type production starring Nicolas Cage. And it's teaching that, you know, the church will be raptured before the tribulation, and we have no concern about these things that Jesus warns about in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, or the book of Revelation. That concerns me. People say, oh, no, that's just for the Jews to go through. To go through the worst Holocaust ever. But us, us, church, we could escape, man. We'd have a big old party in heaven, the wedding supper of the Lamb. The Bible doesn't put the wedding supper at the beginning of the tribulation. I've told you before in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, the opening of the fifth seal you see the saints under the altar. It doesn't say they're having a wedding cake. They're dancing and praising God while the Jews are being slaughtered down here. It says the souls, because they haven't been raptured or resurrected yet, the souls of those you know, who are there, they're crying out to God. They're not having wedding cake. How long, O oh God, until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Jesus said when he comes immediately after the tribulation, not pre-trib, seven years earlier, after the tribulation of those days, he'll gather his elect from the four winds. And then he says what? He talks about being ready for the bridegroom. And the ten virgins need to be ready for the wedding, right? When is that? After the tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation. Then he talks about them being ready for that coming. Not seven years earlier, by the way. Revelation 19, 7 through 9. The end of the tribulation, right? When Jesus is about to come back in verse 11, 1911, he comes back in the white horse, right? In 19, 7 through 9. The wedding has come. The bride has made herself ready. You see, the bridegroom's coming back in Revelation 19 for the bride who has finally made herself ready, verses 7 through 9, right before that. That's the biblical chronology. That's what the church taught, you know, and believed that, that he was coming at the end uh, of, of the age for 1800 and some years until John Darby and others arose in the 19th century and different thoughts came up through a prophetess named Margaret MacDonald 15-year-old girl who said she saw a secret, that you could see the rapture was a secret. And then her pastor, who claimed that the gifts of the Spirit were being revived through his church, who also taught that Christ was corrupted through original sin, he was defrocked by the Presbyterian church because of that, added the, the pre-trip element to it. John Darby picked up on that, and it spread to the Schofield Study Bible in the 1900s, and it spread throughout the church. And now I'm driving home yesterday, and uh, with my wife, and Josiah was with us, and we're listening to Christian radio, and over and over again, I think it was uh, 11.30, till, it was probably 11 to 12 show, we got stuck on the freeway twice because of an accident and whatever reasons, road work, and I think we went home about one, but the guy kept saying, but there's going to be this radical tribulation, and he's talking about mixing DNA and strange creatures and everything, but thank God we'll be gone because we're going to be raptured before that. And you don't have to listen to Christian radio before you hear that over and over and over again. And we're being inundated with the idea that we're not going to go through this time. So all the things that Jesus is warning about really doesn't matter, but it does because the Bible doesn't teach we're going to escape that time. It talks about escaping it only in the context of going through it and or coming out of it by preserving your faith through martyrdom or being, remaining until Jesus comes. And so we're working on a video on, that, on the whole Left Behind movement. And we got reenactments of Margaret McDonald, you know, with her prophesying and John Darby and all this stuff. It'll be really cool. So if you could pray about that, you know, that would be awesome because we really hope it'll impact the body of Christ. Because I believe God is, and I've seen it, because I felt like I was the only post-tribber around. You know, I always felt that Elijah complex almost. Where are they? And I thought, man, when I was a new Christian, I'm just reading through the Scripture, studying the Scripture. I'm saying, wow, there's no... I go through Matthew 24, and Jesus is telling his own apostles... When you see this, the abomination of desolation, you know, said, he's not saying, you know, this is for not you guys, but somebody else, you know. Who do they represent? Matthew 24, well, just chapters earlier, talked about 
your brother continues to sin and you confront him and bring others and he still continues and bring it before the church. Church is mentioned in Matthew 18, long before 24. Matthew 16, 11 too of Matthew. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So they had no concept, that the apostles had no concept that they were leading uh, uh, believers. And to, well, Jesus said, what I'm telling you, I tell to all in, math, in Mark 13, which is just like Matthew 24. And he said, what I've commanded you, when he gave the great commission, I command to I teach others what I've commanded you. And in Matthew, we have the Lord's Supper. We have church discipline. We have the great commission. Do we ignore those? Yes or no? Then why would we ignore Matthew 24? Say, well, that's not for us. It's only a Johnny-come-lately eschatology, folks. And it's causing irreparable harm when the tribulation hits and people freak out because they think they're not supposed to be there. That's why Jesus said, the end is not yet. It's just the beginning. Because he knew this would happen. He says, there's come a time when you're thinking you're going to see one of the days of the Son of Man. It's not going to be like that. Watch out for false Christ and false prophets. Because he knew there's going to be a deception. And that's why Paul says, don't be deceived to think that that day the rapture would come before the Antichrist. He warns about it. Being deceived on that second Thessalonians 2. And I'm like, wow, the scriptures is clear on this. You know what I did? Is I bought the early church fathers as a new Christian. First three centuries of what the early church taught prior to the rise of Roman Catholicism. And as I read through the writings over and over again, they talked about how you have to endure to the end. And that these writings are given to prepare the church to endure the tribulation. And the church will face Antichrist. I'm like, I'm not alone. Praise God. This was the view of the early church. I'm right at home with the word of God with what the early church taught. And praise God, now I don't feel so alone because I see God raising up other people to warn the church of what's to come. It's happening more and more. Praise God. Now, we didn't, I didn't mean to do that excursion, but that always burns on my heart, and I've been working on it now, you can tell. Okay, uh, leave out the outer court, right? Why? It's trampling their foot by the Gentiles. Jesus said when, he, when they rejected him that the, the armies would surround Jerusalem. That happened in 70 A.D., that's different than the abomination of desolation, which is still future. And he said to flee to the mountains. In the Olivet Discourse, when you put Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 together, you have the whole of the Olivet Discourse. And the Romans' armies surrounded Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple, 780. By the way, guess who obeyed Jesus' words to flee to the mountains when they circle Jerusalem? The church. Proving again that his words were warnings to who? The church, amen? But there's also further warnings about the abomination of desolation. There's a personal plural pronoun. When you, 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 to the disciples, the apostles, and it was the early Christians that obeyed that command. And not Peter wasn't even alive still, but it still applied to the church. He'd been crucified up down. and so I, I, I'm sorry, I should say Paul wasn't alive. Certain, certain disciples weren't alive at that point. But some say, oh no, the rapture's any moment though. He can come any moment. That's what the apostles taught. Really? Did the apostles teach Jesus to return any moment? No, that's why Paul said, don't be deceived to think that the rapture, that Christ would come and gather the church first. He said, Antichrist would come first. By the way, did Paul believe in any moment return of Christ? Because you hear a lot of people say, oh, did rapture should happen at any time. That's a pre trib view. No, Paul talked about how God showed him how he would be killed, how he'd be put to death. Amen? Remember that? He said, I'll be poured out as a drink offering. And he was beheaded by Nero. Peter, did he believe that Christ can return any moment in his life? No. Jesus told Peter how he would die. Read John 21. And he was crucified upside down. They didn't believe that. You guys, I emphasize these things because why even study the book of Revelation in any depth at all if it doesn't even pertain to us? There's a lot of things we should study it otherwise. But if it does pertain to us, we didn't know what it says. And what's happening here is Israel will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, Jesus said, until the times the Gentiles are fulfilled. And whether it was the Roman Catholics coming in, whether it was the, the, the Ottoman Empire and the Turks, or whether it's Hamas and many of the so-called Palestinians. By the, by the way, you know Palestine is a name that was a derogatory term given by an emperor, uh, take a derivative of Philistines that hated Israel. And you know, if you call it Palestine, which I don't, but I'll use the term Palestinians because they do, and I'll give the context typically when I do. But did you know the, pa Palestinian, the, the Palestinian newspaper was a Jewish newspaper way back before 1948? The Palestinian orchestra was an all-Jewish orchestra. Did you know that? Do you know a ton of the people over there in the Gaza Strip right now are from Jordan, Egypt, and other countries that just want to live in Israel because it's way nice compared to those other areas? 
And that comes out once in a while because our, the, Pal the Palestinian leadership went to Jordan and said, you know so many of us are Jordanians, so you should give us cheaper gas prices than everybody else. Whoops, slip, slip. Because the whole point is, well, really, we're the real Israelites. No, it's not the case. There are some Arabs, uh, by the way, Arabs prefer to live in Israel under Israeli rule. Did you know that? Then most places, in, then every place pretty much, unless you're one of the princes in Saudi Arabia or what have you. And by the way, did you know Arabs are treated very well? I've been to Israel several times. If you're Arab and you're in Israel, treated very, very, very well. Uh, now, if you're trying to blow up buses, you're not. How dare Israel defend itself and doesn't just allow missiles to fall on other children. Isn't that what's strange that you hear people saying that? They should be able defending themselves. If Canada and Mexico was lopping missiles, can you imagine the rest of the country saying, you guys just have to take it? Just, it's so ridiculous, but it shows you there's a spirit behind what's going on. And Israel will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. And by the way, this has to do with the temple. I've told, I mentioned last week, I went on, I've been on the Temple Mount a couple times. I've been to Israel, I think, four or five times. And a few of those times I've been on the Temple Mount. And it's, Jews aren't on the Temple Mount, not Jewish, leader, not Jewish authorities. It's, it's the so-called, you know, uh, Palestinian authorities. Jews, you know, what happened uh, when, now keep in mind, God said that he'd bring the Jews back into the land. And he did in 1948, May 14th of 1948. And he said they'd give them back Jerusalem, which he did. But by the way, they only gave the UN and, and the other nations because what happened during the Holocaust in Germany, that gave the nations a bit of compassion for a fleeting moment, some fleeting moments. So they said, okay, you know what? We should let them go back into the land. And right, do you know the day they entered their land when it became official? Boom, war from all the countries that surrounded them tried to destroy them. God preserved them. But in 1967, they attacked them again. Another war, the 67 war. And in response to that war, they took the other side of Jerusalem. Temple Mount. But one Jewish soldier went up there and put a, a big Jewish flag up there. General saw it on TV. Get that flag down right now or all of the different Muslim, uh, Muslims are gonna, world's going to descend on Jerusalem, you know. Because, guess what? Jerusalem is being trampled underfoot to this day, to a large degree, by Gentiles. And that's what we see in the Scripture. It's amazing. If you read this Scripture, you know, 100 years ago, you might scratch your head. This makes no sense. You know that, right? Because Israel didn't exist, and it hadn't existed for 1,900 years. But it's not that Israel just exists. It would be that there'd be conflict over the Temple Mount. That's happening right now. Do you guys realize what time it is on the prophetic clock? How we're inching closer and closer? And I don't say it's going to happen in our lifetime. If you've been around my ministry very long, you know I don't ever say that. It's going to happen in our lifetime for sure. I don't know. I'm, I'm cautious about making statements like that because I found out, especially at 50 years old, I'm saying, praise God I never said that because time goes really fast. You know, 10 years goes like this, I found out, you know. Although I said, I'd, I've said before, I'd be surprised, you know. If, and guess what? It's heated up so radically since I've, you know, I've said things are definitely accelerating. They sure are. Verse 2, leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. That's the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Verse 3, this is a verse we didn't cover yet now. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. That's three and a half years. The same amount as the 42 months mentioned earlier. These are the two olive trees. Notice he calls them two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. A lot of fire flying right now into Israel and out of Israel. I just read there's a ceasefire that's going on right now just for a holiday, 24-hour ceasefire. By the way, did you know Hamas knows there's no chance right now that they're going to take Israel? Right now, a lot of this is public relations to get people upset with Israel. So what they do is they fire their missiles from hospitals and schools, and Israel's supposed to just let them, and there's more and more range now, and 90% of the nation or so, I've heard different statistics, are literally, can you imagine 90% of our country in bomb shelters? And some have said as much as almost 100%. Someone was asking me for Planet Israel trip soon. I go, do you realize what's going on right now? This is wait a little bit, you know. 
But uh, it's crazy what's going on over there. And, but right now for Hamas, and Hamas is leading the Palestinians, so-called Palestinians, leading uh, you know, the Muslim world, I like to say, over in the Gaza Strip right now. Hamas, which vows the utter destruction of Israel. How do you negotiate with someone who vows your utter destruction no matter what? How do you negotiate peace with such a people? And they use any peace treaty they can to advance their cause, which is your utter annihilation. You got the news media does not report a lot of what's going on. The, the spiritual context they definitely don't support. Like God, I told you last week when we got into uh, how you know the Temple Mount and how that's supposedly where Muhammad ascended, and that stuff was came hundreds of years after the New Testament was written, six hundred years plus, just to make it the second or third holiest place, depending on the Muslims you talk to in Islam. Oh, Muhammad on a horse ascended from here. That was like long after the book of Revelation was written, that was claimed. That wasn't claimed until sometime after Muhammad died. And now it's, this is our holy ground. That's because Satan is going to set up shop there and the spirit of Antichrist is trying to make the world focus on that place. So he, he wants to be like God. He can't be like God and take his spot in heaven. So he's going to take the next closest place on earth where the world looks to as a holy place. He's going to abominate the temple. And it's being trampled underfoot. But God, praise God. God's going to give authority to two witnesses. And it says uh, they will prophesy. For those people who tell you that prophecy is a gift that's no longer in existence, uh, the Bible begs to differ. Okay? They'll prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to hurt them out of their mouth, they uh, Fire flows out of their mouths and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. Wow. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. No rain during those days. Wow. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes out of the abyss. That's the spirit that possesses the Antichrist, who's also called the beast. Will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where, our Lord, where, where their Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? Just outside the city gates of old Jerusalem. Okay, so this would be within the vicinity of what's called Jerusalem probably today. Those uh, from, now look at verse 9. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their bodies to be laid in a tomb. Notice it's the pe people from peoples and tribes and tongues and different nations will be looking at their dead bodies. Now that's pretty simple to understand. We have, you know, satellite television and CNN, right? Nations, everybody can look at their dead bodies. It couldn't, when this was written, that, that doesn't make any sense, so, huh? Right? When this was written, it would just be the people in the local vicinity to be able to see their dead bodies. So people would read this and scratch their heads. How did the different people, all the tribes and nations and peoples from around the world, look at their dead bodies? This is a book about the future, folks. There's all kinds of evidences of that when you just look at the book. Verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. I think it's interesting, you know, we always see these holidays, you know. They're trying to get rid of, you know, celebrating Christ on Christmas, of course, for years, right? Trying to get rid of, you know, Resurrection Sunday. And the enemies always want to make those kind of holidays about Easter bunnies and Santa Claus when really we as Christians, I think, should focus on, you know, Jesus. Amen? But I'll tell you what, man. They, and then they're getting, trying to get rid of those holidays and introduce new holidays, right? I don't even want to delineate those holidays they're trying, they've introduced or trying to. But there'll be a new holiday, Celebrating the day the two prophets were killed. They'll send gifts to each other. Crazy. Verse 11, But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified 
and, and gave glory to God or to the God of heaven. By the way, verse 13 is one of my favorites. It's in, almost in the middle of the book of Revelation. It's one of my favorite verses in all of Revelation. You know why? Because over and over again, you read the book of Revelation, when you read about the wicked, they're anti-God, they're anti-Christ, and they won't repent. Here's the one verse in the book of Revelation that shows people repenting. That term, giving glory to God, is the signal of repentance. Because late, earlier, later it talks about people who wouldn't repent and give glory to God. You see, here it says they gave, the rest gave glory to God. So praise God, some people are going to get saved during the tribulation period. Amen? That's a good verse. But we're not going to cover all these verses today. Let's back up, though. We're going to look at 3 through 6 and look at more depth. Because we want to ask the question, who are the two witnesses? Who are they? There's a lot of views. Shout out your view. It doesn't have to be your view. Just shout a view that you know of or you've heard of. Come on. Who are the two witnesses? No, oh, man. Everybody has an opinion. Not all at once now. Okay. Huh? Where's that at? It's symbolic. Okay, symbolic of? Yeah, symbolic of probably the church, right? Or, or the Jews. That's a very popular view. In fact, I talked to a gentleman who's written a lot on prophecy, written you know, a couple books on prophecy, uh, a friend of mine, and he views it as the church and the Jews, those two entities. Others believe it's the church, just the church, two, the two olive or lampstands, because think the two lampstands, right? Lampstands, and there's two lampstands. They're described as two lampstands, right? So earlier in the book of Revelation, how are the seven churches described? Jesus walks in the midst of the seven lampstands. And he says the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So it's symbolic for the church. So Michelle, you're right. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people look at it as symbolic. The Geneva Study Bible, which is a Reformed or Calvinistic Study Bible, in 1559, I think it was published or so, uh, had the view that it represents, these two witnesses represent the church. Okay? John Gill, uh, who sat in a, who was a popular Reformed commentator, uh, thought that it was the church. And many have followed suit. So that's one very, very popular view. I'll tell you why I disagree with personally, although I'm going to tell you right now, my opinion is just another opinion. You have to look at the Word of God and say, don't go with what I say. I'm going to give you my reasons because I have the pulpit in this church I pastor. I'm going to give you my reasoning, you know. And I want you to look at it. But I want you to examine reasons based on their own merit. But the lampstands, that, that, that's, you know, that's a little persuasive that, hey, maybe they could represent the church. Or even this, take it further. Two, they're called two what? Olive trees, right? Well, how's the church described with Israel? Here's the Jewish church. Yeah, the church is, or Israel is the olive tree, right? And the Gentiles are what? Branches that have been what? Grafted in the olive tree. Oh, but wait a minute. That doesn't really help the situation. That, that's one olive tree, right? The church and Jews are one olive tree, not two. So to me, that doesn't really help them. And two lampstands, when the churches are earlier described as seven, and, and there's just, and there's seven of them, and there's many other local churches. That was seven local churches. That might be, unless you say it's two churches in Jerusalem, uh, but I have a hard time with the church view. I'll tell you why, that it's the church. First of all, we know the church is going to be witnessing during the tribulation periods, big time. We're all over the world. This is confined to Jerusalem, and these two prophets, what do they do? They kill a ton of people, okay? That's one of their main missions, is to kill a bunch of people. Is that what the church is called to do? Yes or no? No, Jesus said if they reject the gospel, what do you do? Wipe off your feet and go to the next house, right? Jesus said not to resist evil. He said to turn the other cheek. When it comes to faith, how did the disciples react when they were persecuted for their faith? I'm not saying you can't defend your home, okay? I believe Jesus taught you could defend your home, and the Bible teaches that. But as far as the gospel, we are not, to, Jesus said, if my kingdom, John 18, 36, if my kingdom was of this world, then my servants would what? Fight, but they're not. The weapons of our warfare, the Bible says, are not physical, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down strongholds. They're spiritual, Amen. Did the disciples and the early apostles and the churches, the early church, take up arms to spread the gospel? Absolutely not. And plus, it speaks of these two witnesses as two witnesses, and their dead bodies lay in the street. Seems quite literal to me that's two men. Okay, I'm just saying, when you look at it, it seems like it's two men. That's my personal opinion. Believe me, I've looked at that view. I've even leaned thing, okay, maybe. But the more I look at it, the more I look at it in more depth, you know. I always return to it being two literal men. And they're killed, and they're lying in the street. So they kill, and they're killed, and the whole church isn't killed, right? Jesus talked about, you know, Paul talked about how there would be those who remain until the Lord's return. Jesus talked about how he'll gather his elect 
If those days were not cut short, all, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be cut short, the tribulation, right? And he'll gather his elect from the four winds, from the farthest ends of the heavens and the farthest ends of the earth, Mark 13. So his elect, many believers, I don't know how many, will still be alive. Amen? So that view doesn't fit. It, it doesn't fit the context of two men whose bodies are killed and lying in the street. And the church obviously won't totally be killed off. However, you know, I'm not saying it's not a possibility. It just, I think, it puts the church in a militant, bloody color. And it's not the way the church is portrayed in Revelation. It's portrayed as a lamb going to the slaughter and uh, standing for the faith triumphantly. And, it's victor and the church's victory is in its death. You understand? I mean, it talks about, and they overcame Satan. It says they overcame him, speaking of Satan, by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testament, and they loved not their lives unto death. And it talks about, the, uh, it talks about in Act, or Revelation 15, all these believers who were at the sea of glass, who've been martyred and what have you. And it says, it's through their death, it talks about how they overcame the beast. We have victory through holding to our faith and not allowing him and Satan to steer us away from Jesus. Amen? And keeping our testimony. But I want to look at some different views. Absolutely want to look at uh, some different views. And uh, we just talked about the symbolic ones, and I've, I've heard that one too, Michelle, a lot. And I've toyed with it in my mind. I thought, Lord, because it's not clear. We don't want to be dogmatic on this subject. There are some people that are absolutely dogmatic, okay? Where this is the two witnesses for sure. I've met them, and I know they're dogmatic. I say they're dogmatic because they've told me that they're one of the two witnesses. That's dogmatic, folks. <laughs> you know? There's thousands of people who have claimed to be the two witnesses. Did you know that? Well, look at verse 3. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. I saw one guy, he was at a Christian concert I went to when I was young, he had long flowing hair, he was in a big white robe. And he was attracting attention, people were going up to him, it was like a flowing white robe, and, and he said he was one of the two witnesses. No, a white robe does not fit, it says sackcloth. Okay, that's black, okay? It's, old, it's material that isn't comfortable to wear, and, and uh. And usually if someone tells you they want two witnesses, say, hmm, where's your, how come you're not wearing sackcloth? You know, that'll stump them usually, okay? If they're, if they're smart, they'll say, well, I'm waiting until the tribulation starts to put that on. It's in my closet, you know? <laughs> so, crazy stuff, though, man. And there's a lot of strange views, like the Seventh-day Adventists, Ellen White, the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventists, movement, claimed that the two witnesses were killed by, during the French Revolution. Well, that's ridiculous, because they haven't even come yet, you know? The Mormon Church teaches that it be, could be like one of their, their presidents of, of, the, of the Mormon Church, you know, and strange views that we don't need to look at because, well, Mormon is a cult, so. Now, it's interesting uh, when we examine this, we, we ask the question, you know, um, you know, a lot of questions. What's some, I've heard a lot of different statements. I wasn't able to filter them off. What are some other views? It's who? Elijah? Enoch? Moses? You guys are hitting on all the major views. Any other views that you can think of? Hmm. All right. Uh, Lisa? My wife? You and I? No, I don't think so, babe. I love you, but, you know. <laughs> nah. She's asked before, do you think we might be the two witnesses, you know? <laughs> no, she has not done that. I'm teasing her. <laughs> but, uh, but we're all to be witnesses, amen. We're going to talk about that a little later. We don't want to be dogmatic on it, but I heard some views, Moses and Enoch, you know, Moses and Elijah, e e Enoch and Elijah. Uh, we'll look at, look at some of those views as well. By the way, uh, since I brought it up, you know, why sackcloth? Why sackcloth? Who said that? Mourning and repentance. Amen, Chuck. That's it, man. When you go through the scripture, when they wear sackcloth, it's because there's a time of mourning. You know, it's a Remember the Ninevites when Jonah preached repentance or they'd be totally overthrown? They repented for many days, 40 days was it? And it was, they, they wore sackcloth to show their sorrow for sin. And what the two witnesses are doing is they're saying, hey, because it had to do with mourning, it had to do with judgment. And these two witnesses are speaking of, are, are, are talking about the coming judgment and they're wearing sackcloth saying there needs to be a turning from sin. Because this city, Jerusalem, which is used seven or 800 times of God's holy city throughout the Bible, not once, by the way, is Jerusalem, you know, we won't find the word Jerusalem in the Quran once, folks, okay? 
But this city, this beloved city, the city of God, is mystically or spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. So it's given over to the, the worst kind of sexual depravity and the worst kind of occultism. And you go to Israel today and you see that among the, a lot of the Jews, a lot of the atheistic Jews, a lot of them are cultists and so forth, they've fallen from God. It says when the Lord returns, it says he'll drive the evil spirit from the land. Jesus said, I, I come in my Father's name, you receive me not. If another one comes in his own name, him you will receive. So uh, there will be Jews that receive the Antichrist just like Gentiles. And these, these two prophets, like the prophets of old, are speaking to the Jews and the Gentiles. It's not just for the Jews. The nations will see their dead bodies. God's interested in everybody hearing the message. Why two witnesses? Do you know throughout Scripture, God calls for, you could be convicted on the testimony of just one witness. Did you know that? There need to be two or three witnesses. You read that in Deuteronomy a couple different times and elsewhere. There's two witnesses. That means somebody couldn't just make something up about you. It'd be a lot harder to get you convicted of something. Uh, and somebody couldn't just make something up. But here you have two witnesses. And so we understand why there's two. We understand why there's sackcloth. By the way, the other viewpoints. Let's look at some of those other viewpoints. By the way, one viewpoint I'm fond of, but I don't subscribe to, but I, it's close to what I subscribe to, personally, is that it represents Moses and Enoch. I'm sorry, not Moses and Enoch. Enoch and Elijah. Why do you suppose people would pick, and by the way, I'm going to tell you this. I, I'm, I, I really gave this view a, a gander because the early church fathers, many of them, Irenaeus, who sat under Polycarp, who sat under the Apostle John. Hippolytus, Hippolytus sat under Irenaeus. He was a disciple of his. Uh, these are very, very, both very important church fathers, leaders of the early church. Tertullian uh, and other church fathers believed it was Enoch and Elijah. Possible. Possible. My view, why would my view be more important than theirs? We've got to look at all views. Enoch and Elijah. Why Enoch and Elijah? It's a very commendable view. I'll tell you why. Not because the church fathers held to it, because the church fathers aren't on par with Scripture, but when the early church believes something and there's a consensus regarding it, it's worth looking at. Uh, it's worth considering. You're saying, why did they view it this way? And they viewed it this way because these two men were the only two men in the Scripture that never died. Do you understand that? They never died. Enoch was and he was not. Right? It's, hard, it's a very interesting verse. He walked, was, and then he was not. He was taken by God. Elijah never died. He was taken up in a fiery chariot. Remember that? And the idea is it's pointed out a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. And they haven't died yet. And they were both prophets. Elijah was a radical prophet, right? And he did, a lot of, he did similar judgments as to what we see here. No rain, right? Catch that? No rain? Fire down from heaven? Elijah prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Same period of time. And Elijah prayed and then it did rain. Elijah, remember King Ahaziah? He sent companies of 50 against Elijah. What did he do? smoked them, fire, incinerated them, both companies, separate times. Interesting. Enoch, we don't know a whole lot about Enoch, but we do know he was also a prophet. We know in the book of Jude, it talks about how he prophesied that the Lord will come with 10,000 of his saints and so forth. Oh, was he a prophet? Well, how do we know? He named his son Methuselah. Who names their son Methuselah? Did anybody use that for your son? Praise God, I mean, it's probably cute in your way, you know? But, uh, Methuselah means when he dies, the judgment will come. Wow. He died the day the flood started. That's a prophet. Amen. Thanks for the name, Dad. You know, I'm just watching that guy. How's he, how's he healthy? You know? But think about it, man. That, that's pretty cool. I mean, we think about it. But wait a minute. A mm, little bit of problem. Not that it can't be them. I think that's a great pick, by the way, personally. Uh, but... The Bible does say it's appointed a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. But there's exceptions at time in the scripture. Did Lazarus die twice? Yes or no? Yeah, he did. Jairus' child? Yeah. There's people who have died and been resuscitated, right? So there are exceptions to that rule. So you can't say, but then at the same time, you can't say, but they did die. These guys never died yet. There's a point there. It's interesting. We don't know, though, that they didn't die. For sure, Enoch was, and he was not. God took him. 
Does that mean he's growing old and he looks like a thousand years old right now? Or he preserved in his health and he won't, or be res- We don't know exactly what's going on there, but it is interesting. But even though you can say, hey, there's exceptions to that rule, so you can't necessarily use that, you can't still say this with these two men. If God took two men before they died and perhaps he preserved their lives still some way, perhaps he took those two men and did that for a specific purpose, to use them in the end. That would trip people out too, amen? So that, that, that is somewhat commendable because I can overthrow that view by saying there's exceptions to if Hebrews 9.27. There's other people that died, so it does, but then I have to back up and say, but wait a second. What makes it commendable is he preserved their lives, and that may be the reason. That's why if you have that view, I think that's a pretty good view, Enoch and, and Elijah, uh, and I, that's a respectable view. If you have a view that it's the church, I'm not saying that's not a respectable view. I just say, but however, if people turn that into, well, the church is supposed to use force, you know, and, 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 and kill a bunch of people, and that's what this is talking about. I can see how they get twisted, and the church is not to go around killing people, but these two prophets. And it's like, well, how come these two prophets have that authority? Well, if you're a leader in Israel right now, do you think you have the authority to protect your nation with fire coming down from heaven in the form of rockets right now? Absolutely. Because I believe personally they're tied to Israel as a nation. And that's going to get, my viewpoint will come in a little bit, and it's going to make, I believe, some sense. However, my view is kind of a strange view. I've never heard my view, so you must check, you must beware. I'm just letting you know. Although it's a strange, convoluted view that you'll understand, and you'll say, hmm, wow, I think. Or you might say, I'm sticking with Enoch and Elijah, okay? Or whoever, the church and the Jews, or whoever you got. Okay, but just look and listen and think, you know. So, uh, that's, these are some of the views that are looked at. Um, and, you, and everybody, the, the views I was planning on looking at, the views that you guys mentioned for the most part, you know. Uh, now, these are called the two prophets, though. That's why I say it's two prophets, and their bodies lie dead in, in, in you know, Jerusalem. And, and it's, 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 I believe, two people. And that's how the Bible spe- specifically speaks of, of men. But why the imagery, though? Why two lampstands? Why two olive trees? I believe that the imagery actually supports the view that it's two individual men, okay? I believe the imagery actually supports the view that it's literally uh, two different men. Why so? One thing I love, and if you've been in this church for very long, you know we love it as a church, and a lot of people love it here, is, is biblical typology, you know? The pictures in the Old Testament of Jesus, amen? The events that, that foreshadow future events or personages that foreshadow Jesus, foreshadow, uh, you know, his birth, foreshadow his crucifixion. You know, look at Isaac being taken up Mount Moriah by his son, by his father. Take your son, your only son whom you love. And Jesus is, the first time you see love in the New Old Testament, it's take your son whom you love, your only son. First time you see the word love in the New Testament, it's God saying, this is my son whom I love, and God gives his only son. Takes him the same exact mountaintop where Abraham is told not to kill Isaac at that point after Isaac's taken the wood up to the mountain. And Jesus takes the wood up the mountain to the cross, amen. And he doesn't spare his son because God became a man to die for our sins. And that was a picture foreshadowing. In Germany, we wanted to go so bad because we, get, we do uh, ministry. We get invited a lot to go to like the Netherlands and do things. And it's right next to Germany. We wanted to go watch their, their, their they do the, this whole thing, you know, uh, the passion of Christ you know, um, man, what do they call it? Annie, give me the German name. Okay, very good. <laughs> there's a lot, oh, there's Germans right here besides, besides Annie. Uh, and they basically, they, they do the Passover. Uh, not the Passover. They, 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 the whole town gets involved in the crucifixion, modeling it. And it's a whole town, lawyers and doctors and everybody. And some people are, just, a thousand people in the crowd and there's, there's choirs and the whole, it's, the town's converted. It's because in the early 1900s, there was a plague that was wiping out whole German towns. And they prayed and said, God, if you spare our town, we'll commemorate you all the time and show, show Jesus. And they were, didn't get the plague. I'm not saying that was God's thinking. I'm just saying that's what happened. And they've done that ever since. And it was basically the first passion play. Not that in Germany. That's a passion play that's gone down for years since. The first passion play is Abraham and Isaac. God's showing forth his son, amen? And a lot of times, your eyes just open. You see the beauty and the power of prophecy when you look at the typology, because only God can do that, folks. It, it, you can't say it's accidental, because it happens over and over again, showing Jesus 
Amen. It builds your faith. A brother was saying to me, man, I love it when you go through typology. He goes, I, you know, I listen to a lot of you know, Christian stuff, and how come more people don't get into typology? And it was Dave Hughes. He's like, I love typology. How come people don't do more? Oh, no. It's one of the most beautiful things in Scripture. It's so powerful. It's a great way to t- show a skeptic Jesus. When I go to Israel, I witness the Jews. You know what I do? I whip out the typologies. Oh, so you, you celebrate Passover, right? Well, let me show you Jesus in the Passover. You know, you, you know pick, sometimes I'll say pick anybody in the Old Testament. I'm hoping they pick one I can really draw a type from, you know. <laughs> one person goes, okay, Jonah. Okay, Jonah, great. Belly of fish, three days, three nights, came out, resurrection. You know, the, the turmoil on the boat because of his sin. He's the first Adam. Sin comes, boom. He's thrown in the water. Judgment stops because of his, you know, the picture of his death. He rises again. Nineveh repents. There's salvation. Oh, wow. It's over and over again, folks. But check this out. I believe typology casts light on this passage. And so many people don't realize, wow, there's a lot of insight you get from typology on a lot of matters, not just who Jesus is. And the passage I want you to go to is Zechariah chapter 4. And when you're going to Zechariah chapter 4, I want you to consider the context. I want you to consider the context because the context is quite revealing. What's going on in Israel right now? War. Amen. What's one of the main reasons that the Muslim world hates the Jews? Not every Muslim, by the way. And by the way, this isn't an Arab Jewish thing. There are many, many godly Arabs that love Jesus. Amen. Amen. And uh, there's Arabs, Arabs are some of the most, some of the most wonderful Christians you'll ever meet are Arab Christians that just love Jesus so passionately. So don't ever make this a racial thing. It's a spiritual thing. But it's interesting because right now it's over the Temple Mount. It's over Jerusalem. And do you know the, te- the temple would have probably been rebuilt a long time ago if it was not for the enemies of Israel? Do you know that? And we talked about last week about the Temple Institute and others, different, uh, you know, Jewish schools, you know, uh, and so forth. And now they're, I don't want to get into all that again, but they want to rebuild the temple. They've been wanting to do it for years. But the opposition is from not just one nation, but the nations that surround them. Trying to keep them from rebuilding the temple. There's a lot of Orthodox Jews that want to rebuild the temple. But you know what, folks? Think about this for a second. I think this is important. That was going on in Zechariah's day. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed the temple, right? They came back into the land after the Babylonian captivity, after the Persians took over. And they were wanting to rebuild the temple. And they had different oppositions, Sanballat and others. And the nations around them were hissing and threatening them. And they were outnumbered. And it seemed like an impossible task. They couldn't build, just like it seems impossible today, right? It seems impossible. And everybody said it. A lot of people said, a lot of Jews, it's impossible. We can't do it. They ended up building a temple, man. Rebuilding it. A sword in one hand, a trowel in the other, man. What a picture that is. But guess what? It didn't seem possible. And just when you read Revelation 11, remember the context. Before we talk about the two witnesses, what are the first two verses about? The temple. This is in the context of the temple. And it being trampled underfoot in the outer courts. We talked about why that might be and how the temple could still be rebuilt with this peace treaty preserving even the Dome of the Rock, maybe, or what have you. But how can that happen? It seems impossible. Well, this seemed even more impossible back then because Israel has way more firepower than they did back then. And look what happens in in, in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. He said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold with its bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also to what? To olive trees by it. How many olive trees? Does that sound familiar? Two olive trees by it. One on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? In other words, this is something God wants us to know about. That's why it's here in the text. And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to to Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel was the governor, the the civil leader at that time of Israel, okay, of the southern 
well, right now, southern and the northern kingdom went into exile, so you could just say Israel, of Jerusalem. They said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my what? My spirit, says the, the Lord of hosts. So in other words, guess what? They were not going to build that temple by might, physical might, or physical power. It was going to have to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. God's spirit at work, opposing God's enemies that surrounded them and allowing the atmosphere to where they could rebuild the temple. Isn't that interesting? And that's what the lamp stands. By the way, lamps require oil, right? For there to be fire, that oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. The two lamp stands would represent two people who were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. What are you? Now listen to this. What are you, O great mountain? See, it was a great mountain. It was a huge mountain, man, to rebuild the temple. No way it was to be done by human agency alone. What are you? Then it says, what are you, O great mountain, before who? Zerubbabel. You will become a what? A plain. And he will bring forth, he, that's Zerubbabel, will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Verse 8. Also the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will what? Finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And he goes on to say, for who has despised the day of small things? You ever hear that term? Who has despised the day of small things? It's right from the Bible. But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the earth. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on the left and on its left? And I answered the second time, and he said to him, it's interesting, what are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes which empty the golden oil from themselves? So he answered me saying, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the what? These are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, he already identified one of the holy ones, the anointed ones. Who was it? Come on, who was it? We saw his name three times. Zerubbabel. Now there's another one. Who is that? Joshua, the high priest. Okay, if you read chapter 3, Right before this, Joshua was the one who's like picked like a brand out of the fire and being going to be used by the Lord's radically. Then the Zerubbabel is added to the mix. So you got these two anointed ones, and it's these two leaders as a civil leader and as the high priest, the spiritual leader of Israel, who created the atmosphere by God's Spirit to rebuild the temple. These were the two witnesses back then. I think if you said Zerubbabel, and Joshua were the two witnesses, which I haven't seen anybody say. I'm sure somebody said it. That might be a really good choice. They died. That means they died twice. Well, Lazarus died twice. A few people died twice. So Hebrews 9.27 doesn't stop that from happening. Am I saying it's those two? No, I'm not. Yes, I am. Yes and no. It's not those two literally, okay? I'm going to go further with this, though, Okay? Hold on. But do you, see, do you see where we're at? Wouldn't this not lend to the understanding or at least show or, or give strong evidence that the two, the two witnesses would be two what? Literal individuals. Amen? I think the background supports individuals rather than being symbolic of, of the church or the Jews. I gave you reasons. I don't think it's the church already, but these are strong reasons. It's not representative of, these aren't representative of the whole church. It's two literal men. When you go to two witnesses, and this is the background of the book of Revelation in Zechariah. I told you over and over again, the book of Revelation, more than any book in the Bible, more than any book in the Bible, ties together the Old Testament passages and some new into one consummation of the age. And Zechariah 4 is the background of this. And the olive trees and what have you are the background to these two anointed ones, and they were two literal men. And the interesting thing is, this chapter starts off with the temple being trampled underfoot. That was a context in Zechariah's day. And these two witnesses came in Zechariah's day with power from the Holy Spirit. And God was able to oppose his enemies and get his work done. And I'm not saying that means the two A lot of people think that the Antichrist will rebuild the temple. I don't say that. I don't know. 
But it could be that the two witnesses do the same thing in the end times, and they create atmosphere for the temple to be rebuilt. I don't know. It doesn't say that the temple will be rebuilt before the tribulation starts either. It's in the middle of the seven-year treaty that the, the sacrifices are stopped. So it could be a treaty, but these two witnesses can create an atmosphere. I don't know. I'm not going down and being dogmatic on it. I don't know how it's going to happen. And I'm not saying it's Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua, but I think that I find it funny that you hardly ever, if you do, hear their names mentioned in this regard. But I'm not saying it's them. Although I believe what we've read here is very important to remember because they will come into the bigger and final picture that I will give you. And I want to go on now and add a little bit to this. And I, I think it's important that we now consider Elijah and Moses. Not Elijah and Enoch. Why Elijah and Moses? Because Elijah and Moses performed the types of miracles that we're seeing here, right? Right? So I know, just stick with me, because like, wow, this was actually cool with Zerubbabel and Joshua. We're going to hang out there a little longer. Well, you know, we'll get back to that, but Think of, we looked at Elijah already, right? Fire from heaven, stopping the rain, right? Well, what about Moses? What happens that Moses has done? That happens here in chapter 11. How about any kind of plague, pretty much? All these plagues. All kinds of plagues, man. And also, how about water being turned to blood? Did Moses do that? That was the seventh plague? Wow, man. Oh, well, there's, we can go beyond that, though. Moses and Elijah. Why those two, maybe? Well, they both were prophets, by the way. God said he'd rise up a prophet like unto Moses. That ended up being Jesus, by the way. But the two witnesses, Elijah, I think, is such a good pick. Why? Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It says that Elijah will come again before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it says that. The day of the Lord is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. So that's why Elijah, I think, is, is almost a shoe in I say almost. That's for a reason. <laughs> I'm sorry. We have to look at all the vari variations, and really, we really want to study this. We have to look at the pros and cons of the different views. But wow, he's supposed to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, right? Moses and Elijah, this is important. Moses and Elijah appeared together with Jesus at his first coming as a two, two guys. You know that, right? On the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember that? Jesus went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He was transfigured before some of his disciples. Remember that? Looked like the sun and the noonday and just bright. His, his, his clothes were just glowing white light. They were blown away. And he was there speaking with Moses and Elijah about his impending death that he would accomplish. It was an accomplishment, amen? Laid down his life for a sheep. Wow. They were there before his first coming, or at his first coming, not before, but at his first coming. And they recognized, remember Peter? Like, wow, this is wonderful. Jesus, you know, let, let us build, you know, three tabernacles, one for you and Moses and Elijah. And then God shouts or says from heaven, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. I mean, Peter, it's not about what you want to do. I'm doing something radical here. Be quiet, you know. And it's interesting because the focus needs to be on Jesus ultimately, amen? Even when we look at these two witnesses, witnesses of what? Witnesses of Jesus, amen? By the way, Moses and Elijah, they were, they were there as a team already. And Elijah is supposed to come back before the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's really fascinating when you think about it. And by the way, Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. Two witnesses. Oh, wow, that view is sounding maybe even better than Enoch and Elijah, right? And I think Elijah, I pick over Enoch if it's going to be one of those two, and Moses, because of Malachi 4 or 5, he's going to come before the great terrible day of the Lord, and he was teamed up with Moses at the Mount of Transfiguration. Well, how does that fit with the second coming, the Mount of Transfiguration? Because the Mount of Transfiguration was a picture of the Lord coming back on the day of the Lord. And there they were with Jesus. How do I know that? Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Isn't the book of Revelation a fun book as well? 1 Peter chapter 1. Oh, 
Well, those Blessed Hope people, man, they just can't wait to go through the tribulation. That's not what I said. I said, it's a fun book. Don't twist my words. Okay. Revelation chapter 1. And by the way, I always say, pre, mid, or post, you know, Calvinistic or Arminian or anywhere in between or whatever, these are in-house discussions. We're all believers, amen, that love Jesus. And my pre-trib brethren, my Calvinistic brethren that I disagree with, they're brothers that love Jesus, amen. And uh, so many of them, and they say, well, I know some that aren't. Well, I know people that aren't pre-trib, that are post-trib, and that aren't Calvinists, that are non-Calvinists or Arminians or non-Calvinists. There's, I don't call myself an Arminian that don't love Jesus. Yeah, there's people on both sides, you know. So this is an in-house discussion. We need to love each other, amen, be friendly with each other, and it needs to be like a table discussion. We still need to be serious about our convictions. Or, you know what I'm saying? We need to be honest with, I think the Scriptures say this, and it's very important that we get it, you know. And, uh, but at the same time, we need to love each other, amen. I mean, I think what Doug Stapleton came from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, was our worship leader for a great member of our fellowship, one of my good friends, and he was worship leader around eight, ten years and pre tribber the whole time until toward the very end. I never said, oh, he's a pre tribber He can't lead worship. He can't do that song right unless he knows when the rapture is exactly. <laughs> you know? No, he loved Jesus, man. And that's the beauty of this is that we, and I love it, man, because I believe we show our integrity by taking a stand for what we believe but doing it in love. Okay? If you just love, but you just ignore what you believe the Scriptures say, that's not good. Or if you're just, oh, the Scriptures say this, and you hate people, or you're angry at everybody, and my view is the only view, and da-da-da, and I'm the only saved person, then you got another problem, real serious, you know? That's not to minimize the importance of the subject matter, obviously. I don't, you know. But um, and it's also recognizing that you could be wrong, and I could be wrong, or we could be wrong, and, you know, I don't think I'm wrong. But if on the way up and I'm wrong, I get raptured early, I'll say, praise the Lord, I'm so glad you were right. <laughs> if you go through it, will you say, this is not the blessed hope. You know, this is the blessed hope. And turn to the Antichrist. Or will you say, praise God, I've heard we could go through it. Here we are. Praise the Lord. I'm going to hang on to Jesus. Amen? That's the attitude to have. Well, I'm just pan-trib. Now, nah, that's a cop-out. Have some kind of opinion, at least. No, I don't know. I'm not saying it's copy. You may not have studied it, but study all the issues. But check out 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. I'm sorry. 2 Peter. It's real close by. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When? For when, we, when he received honor and glory from God, the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. That was in the Mount of Transfiguration. Wow. Verse 18. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. It's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration when Elijah and Moses were there. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But notice this, the transfiguration, when Jesus appeared and he showed them his glory. What was that a picture of? Back up to verse 16. For we did not sh- sh- follow cleverly devised tales, when he made known to you the power and what? Coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we're eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay, then you go to the end of verse 19. He's talking about the day uh, the morning star rises in your hearts. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. And he's saying when Jesus came and showed himself like that in his power, it was a preview of coming attractions, the second coming of Christ. He was showing what it's going to be like when he comes in power. And it's just interesting to me that Elijah and Moses were there. And it was a picture of his second coming. Interesting, because they witnessed for three and a half years, Right? Then for three and a half days, which could be symbolic of three and a half years, not necessarily, we'll look at that later. That would be the second half of the tribulation. Seventh trumpet happens right after that. Paul said we'd rise at the last trumpet. Boom, perfect picture there possibly. But either way, they were there when Jesus typified what's going to happen at the second coming. And Elijah was said to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Interesting. And Moses and Elijah both did those kinds of miracles. And their team, 
At least they were. All very, very, very interesting. Now, did you follow that? Pretty cool, I think. Now, interesting problem, though, is when John the Baptist came, what did Jesus say of John the Baptist? That's right, Michelle. Uh, he said, you know, Matthew 11, 13 and 14, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. Interesting. However, uh, it's further clarified too in Matthew 17, 10 through 13, where Jesus asked the question about Elijah as the forerunner, and he states that Elijah will come, 17, 11, and has already come, 17, 12 and 13. Well, that's kind of interesting because he says Elijah will come, but he has already come. Now that just stretches it out again possibly, right? When John the Baptist asks, are you Elijah? He says, no. What is going on here? Jesus said, he, that's Elijah to come. But then he also said, Elijah will come. But if you can accept it, he has come in John the Baptist. But he's not saying he won't come in the future. But John the Baptist asks, are you Elijah? He says, no. What is going on? The clarification is right here in Luke 117. It speaks of John the Baptist and Elijah, and it says of John the Baptist, he will be a man with spirit, with the spirit and power of Elijah. Catch that? You can just look it up at Luke 1.17. John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He wasn't literally the reincarnation of Elijah. Do you understand? By the way, John the Baptist, we know he was born. Elijah never died, right? Elijah, he was born to Elizabeth. So when Jesus is saying he's Elijah to come, he's talking about the spirit and the power that was on Elijah. Remember, Elisha wanted a double portion of that. He says, that's what the scripture is clear. I love how the Bible works, man. So, he's, oh, well, it says this here and it says, well, do you see this? Just like Jesus said that they would see, those who were, there were them there that would see, you know, would taste the, the, the coming of his, his second coming, the glory. And then just, it's like, well, he didn't come back yet. Well, then right after he says that, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, every gospel, synoptic gospel, right after that, he takes him to the holy mountain and he shows him the second coming. And then Peter says, that's what was going on there. They were able to see what's going to happen in the future. So you've got to compare all the scripture together. That's why somebody, if they only read a little bit of the Bible, skeptic, and they read this, that, and they don't read everything, they're not going to understand it. And right here we find out that John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He wasn't literally Elijah. And I think this is interesting because that means, by the way, Elijah would come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's the very end. So, my view is this. I don't believe it's corporate, the Jews and the church or the church. Although I believe the church is to be a witness. And I do believe that all Israel will be saved. And the church is going to be a witness all around the world. When, when the gospel kingdom is preached, all the world's witness, all nations, then the end will come. Amen? I don't believe it's corporate. I believe based on Zechariah chapter 4, it's two individual men. My belief is this, and, it, and I'm going to hedge my belief just a little bit. My belief is Joshua and Zerubbabel are typologies picturing two leaders in Israel. Maybe a spiritual, maybe with a civil leader protecting Israel in the end. And it won't literally necessarily be those two men, though, I don't believe. I believe it could be two brand new men with the spirit and power that was on Zerubbabel and on Joshua and on Moses and on Elijah. Now, don't misunderstand my view and say, Joe believes the two witnesses are four. Zerubbabel, Joshua, Elijah, and Moses. I don't think it's any of those four literally. I believe all four of those guys in twos, both pairs at one time, picturing Christ's second coming, the ministries Elijah and Moses had before they were with Jesus, picturing the second coming, and Joshua and Zerubbabel. I believe those are all four, four men are types of those last two witnesses. And those last two witnesses can very well be brand new people. They're just humans. Or it could be Moses and Elijah. That's where I stand, literally. Or it could be Elijah, most literally, if we're going to go literal at all and make it a specific person from the past, that's literally a blast from the past with all the fire coming down and everything, right? But two men, I think Enoch and Elijah, good choice. Elijah and Moses, a better choice because they're teamed up. But 
I personally believe it very well could be two men that were, are born in Jerusalem or what have you somewhere, and the spirit and power that came upon Elijah comes upon them, so they fulfill the prophecies about Elijah and the other witness. Do you understand that? And that Zerubbabel and Joshua are just pictures or types of that. However, I'm just giving you a lot of food for thought. We don't want to be dogmatic on it, but I just gave you a lot of thoughts, and I think Zechariah chapter 4 goes a long way in typology to show it's two individual men, I believe almost for sure. Who they are, I believe, is at least typified, if not two men coming back literally. Okay? And we don't know. We'll see. You know, there might be a time where we're like, well, Joe, you got him right, but he's wrong. You know, it doesn't matter. We don't die on this hill. It's just very fascinating to look at. And it makes us look at a lot of other scripture and see that what God's doing, and it's really cool. The coolest thing is, is that, have you ever just wished God would just say, everybody be quiet, I'm talking. <laughs> no? You ever, I've done that. I'm like, God, why don't you just, I would love, you, you're absolutely perfect. I can never improve on your plan, but sometimes I just wish you'd just stop the planet, break into CNN, Fox News, and everybody else and say, okay, listen to me for five minutes. And that nobody could escape, and everybody had to listen. Everybody woke up, and then they had to explain it away, but you just spoke for five minutes, and it was so clear because it didn't come through just their TVs. It was booming from heaven, and you, and you shook the earth and all these other things. But you know what? You, his plan is a thousand times better than I could even, a trillion, you know, infinite better than what we could ever come up with. The cool thing is, is he does do that right here with two witnesses. Amen? He says, you're going to listen. You can't kill these guys for three and a half years. Isn't that cool? And they don't go out, by the way, to make war and destroy people. They're defending their nation, I believe, defending the, their people. That's why I don't believe it's the church. Our citizenship is in heaven, amen? And uh, so, but the main thing to keep in mind is that's just a lot of food for thought, but also we don't want to get all caught up and spend the rest of our lives writing books on who the two witnesses are, Okay. I had a brother, dear brother, Joe, send me all your notes on Revelation. I want to turn it into a book. He asked me, oh, you know, over oh, and he's great brother. I'm like, do you know how long that book would be? Just this would be a little book, right? So I'm like, bro, I'd rather work in other situations, but because there's so many, much to talk about in this book. But the key is this. We need to be focused right now on, we need, it's good to look at these things, it's important, but we need to be more focused on the fact that we have been called to be witnesses, amen, in this dark and dying world. We don't even know if this is going to happen in our lifetime. Although you look at things going on, it makes you pay attention because it could. And I'll tell you this. The Bible says in the book, book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem because he said the Holy Spirit would endue them with power. They would be his witnesses. The disciples were his disciples now. They've died. But he said, you'll be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen? That's us. We're in the uttermost parts of the earth from Israel right now. We're supposed to be witnesses here. And I love in the book of Acts, they prayed and, and, and they sought God in Acts chapter 4 and they, they cried out to him and, and they sought, sought him and it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The place was shaken and the word of God, they spoke the word of God with boldness. We need to be praying. Say, God, use me by your spirit. You're, he's going to use the two witnesses, but you know what? Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him. This is the believers. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their what? Testimony, see? And they loved not their lives unto death. We have a testimony that we're to give of who Jesus is. Witnesses to the fact that he is the resurrected Savior, that he died and rose again, he fulfilled the prophecies. We have the testimony of what he's done in our lives, that he saved us, amen? We need to go to the highways and byways. We need to be sharing that with, uh, with, with others. We need to get the salt out of the shaker, amen? And then Acts chapter 5, I mean, they're flogged. In 4 and 5, they get persecuted. In 5, they're, they're flogged, and they're told not to come back and preach. They turn around, they go back and preach. They say, and it says they rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. That's our attitude towards suffering as believers, amen? These two witnesses, what a privilege to be these two witnesses, amen? But they get martyred. You should look at it as a privilege that you get to be a witness, amen? And that we're called to be ambassadors for Christ. We're called to be firefighters for Christ. Praise God, we got a number of firefighters that are literally firefighters here, but all of us are supposed to also be spiritual firefighters. In the book of Jude, it talks about snatching people from the fire, and right before that, he says, praying in the Holy Spirit, building yourself up in your most, most holy faith. Amen? So you pray, and you get built up in the power of the Spirit, and you say, Jesus, let me live for you. Let me make each day for you. Give me divine appointments to be a witness to the lost. Amen? And help me shine the light of Jesus so people can come to Christ. And then you just, you, you just pray, and you cry out to God, and then you just serve him. Amen? You go out, and you, you, be, you be a witness first and foremost in the way you live your life. Amen? That you're dedicated to God. 
that you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love and peace and joy, long-suffering, gentleness and goodness, these faithfulness, you know, you know, self-control, these things in your life. That should be happening at home. It should be happening in your marriage. That should be happening in your workplace. So first and foremost, you say, Lord, help me be a shining light and show what it means to follow Christ and what Christ can do with a life. Amen? In your life. And that just takes surrender to Jesus, man. That takes leaning on Jesus and saying, God, transform my life. I trust you. That takes, first of all, being saved, coming to know Jesus, and be cleansed by his blood from your sins so you're not going to hell. Amen? And then asking God to give you strength to live that life. That's a witness of the lost. You know how many people come to Christ, millions of people have come to Christ? By watching Christians in their workplaces. The early church, they didn't just do evangelism. They just lived their faith. Live your faith. That's a powerful witness in this day and age. Amen? And then share your faith by the way you live and also by the way you share. Let's snatch people from the fire. Let's remember that we, it doesn't ultimately matter who they are. We'll find out soon enough. God could have given their names, amen? He does want us to search things out. He says it's to the glory of kings to search out his secrets. So it's good to search the scripture. But you know what? The main thing is being a witness for Jesus, amen? But you can't be a witness until you're saved. Are you saved? Are you trusting the Lord Jesus Christ? If you are not trusting him for your salvation, you're under the wrath of God. You're, the, the very judgments the Bible talks about will come upon you. And there's eternal hell. And, and the Bible says God created hell for the devil and his angels. And they doesn't want you to go there. But all rebels will end up in the lake of fire. But God so loved the world, Jesus said, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? So if you acknowledge your sin and you embrace Jesus through faith and you put your trust in him as your Lord and Savior, you'll be cleansed from your sin. You'll be justified, made right with God. Amen? He'll give you a new heart, a new life. And you'll start desiring the things of the kingdom of God rather than sin. It'll still be a struggle. But as you seek Jesus, he'll give you strength to overcome that struggle and strength to live a godly life and be a witness for him now and forevermore. Amen? And praise God. We see people get saved there in, Act, in Revelation 11. Amen? And somebody asked the scripture. It's in Daniel 11, Daniel 12, that I mentioned last week, that his servants would do exploits. That's the King James. His servants will lead people to righteousness. They'll have insight and they'll share in the end times. Chapter 12 as well, I think verse 3, talks about leading many to righteousness, those who have insight. That needs to be us and others in the last days who know what the Word of God says. Amen? Praise God. Let's uh, stand and, and, and prepare our hearts for communion and focus on what the Lord's done for us.